<laughs> Welcome, everyone. And thank you all for joining the Institute for Public Knowledge and the GovLab at NYU tonight for this inaugural event in a series that is part of the new Future of Democracy Working Group here at IPK. For those of you who are new to IPK, uh, we, are <laughs> we are a social science institute at NYU that supports communication between researchers and broader publics around major public issues. Our working groups consist of graduate students and professors from within NYU as well as members of business, nonprofit, and academic arenas beyond the university. Members collaborate to write papers, host conferences, and meet regularly to discuss their individual projects. If anyone here tonight is interested in joining or learning more about our Future of Democracy event, please come see me, Jessica Coffey, the Associate Director of IPK, after the event at the reception. The next event in this Future of Democracy series will take place on Wednesday, September 6, this coming Wednesday, at 12 p.m. in this very room. We will have a conversation with Jeff Mulgan, Chief Executive of Nesta, on collective intelligence and democracy. Please visit IPK's website for additional details and to RSVP. Now I'd like to introduce the leader of the Future of Democracy Working Group, Beth <laughs> Simone Novak, our humble leader. <laughs> Beth is director of the GovLab at NYU and its MacArthur Research Network on open and governance. She is a professor in technology, culture, and society at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering and a senior fellow here at IPK. Beth was recently appointed as New Jersey's first chief innovation officer and previously served in the White House as the first United States deputy chief, te chief technology officer and director of the Open Government Initiative under President Obama. UK Prime Minister David Cameron appointed her senior advisor for open government. In conversation with Beth tonight will be our guest, Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. Audrey is known for <laughs> revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Haskell, as well as building the online spreadsheet system EtherCalc in collaboration with Dan Bricklin. In the public sector, Audrey served on Taiwan's National Development Council's Open Data Committee and K-12 Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. In the private sector, Audrey worked as a consultant with Apple, Oxford University Press, and Social Text. And in the social sector, Audrey has actively contributed to GovZero, which we'll talk about tonight, a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for the civil society and a call to fork the government. Um, I now pass the mic to Audrey and to Beth to get us started. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you to IPK for hosting us. For those of you in the back, we have seats up here in the front, and we promise, A, we won't call on you uh, <laughs> m often, and if you have to leave early, please don't worry, neither Audrey nor I will be insulted, so please feel free to come up and take a seat. We'd love to, we'd love to fill in the room and have you join us. Um, so I'm really thrilled and grateful to Audrey for being here for our first inaugural Future of Democracy lecture, mm -hmm. conversation as we're going to have it. I don't know that I'm, I'm hopefully not the fearless leader. I am just the modest hostess um, of a conversation that I think we're all eager to have and eager to talk about. It's very hard to live in the United States right now and not to be in the world right now, I think, and not to be deeply fearful and worried about the state of democracy. So we started, let me just give a quick word of why this is why we started this conversation. Because we're living right now in a time in a country in which every day is election day, in which party politics are coming ever before problem solving and public interest. Um, and I think we're very deeply concerned that this is not simply another cycle in the swing back between one party and another, but potentially something deeper and more dangerous that's going on. There are no tanks in the streets. If you've read Zblatt and Levitsky's, uh, the two Harvard professors who wrote one of the many books on the death of democracy that have come out this year, it's a particularly good one. 
they very chillingly paint the picture of how the dangers that we face today are not tanks in the streets, it's not people with guns, it's not people being thrown in prison, but it is in fact what we're seeing, which is Putin, who is permanently in office by swapping the role of president and prime minister, it's Erdogan in uh, Turkey, it's Orban in Hungary, it's Maduro in Venezuela, it's Modi in India, and of course it's Trump here in the United States. People who deride their opponents as criminals, who maintain a constant sense of threat and uh, uh, support and endorse violence in our political culture, who show contempt for our critics, for their critics and for the media, and who frankly stoke conspiracy theories <laughs> Uh, galore, again, to reinforce their power, and in ways that actually make us, I think, deeply fearful about our democracy. Add on top of that the fact that for a long time now, trust in government, even before these current spate of authoritarian and populist leaders, that trust in government has been declining over many, many years. In 1958, 73% of people said that they could trust the federal government in the United States to do the right thing just about always. In 2013, that number was 28%. And right now, in most recent surveys, the number of people who say government can do, it doesn't, at the federal government at least, does an excellent job is now at 2%. Uh, we're going to hear tonight, though, not about the United States, but about Taiwan, and hopefully uh, not only about the challenges that are faced, but hopefully some very hopeful developments that Audrey and her colleagues have been able to bring about. We would like to find out the ways in which you are helping to make government and democracy stronger, to do a better job at delivering services, and what the vision is and for creating more effective and legitimate policies, uh, and really to understand what it is, what this revolution is that's happening in Taiwan that may hopefully give us all some hope <laughs> for what's happening here. So welcome very much, and let me start, we're gonna make this as much of a conversation, knowing Audrey, she will hack whatever it is that I ask her and talk about, I hope, what she wants to, but I will start things off by really just asking you how did you get started? What was the problem? Was it this problem that we're talking about now? What was it that motivated you? What was the challenge, really, that you were setting out to solve? Mm -hmm. And was it a problem of democracy or of governance or of both? So, uh, hello. Uh, this this starts a voice, uh, like any other theory, but is it anyway? Maybe not. So, um, still not much better. Um, uh, actually, can, can people hear me without, without using? Yeah, so, so, this, yeah, because we have this as well. So, so, maybe just at this distance? Is that okay with, with you guys? Okay. So, yeah, very glad to be here. And uh, actually, last week I was in London and had an uh, hour and a half conversation with the Nesta folks and, and Joe Morgan as well. So, uh, <laughs> we're very much uh, in line uh, in, in value and as, as well as in the various um, innovations, democracy that we're working on. So, this is my office in, in Taipei City. Uh, it's called the Social Innovation Lab. Uh, and it's very playful and, and peaceful. Uh, and it kind of resembles uh, my post as the digital minister. Um, it's a anarchist. Um, I, I don't have a contract with the Taiwan government. I had a compact or a covenant, uh, and uh, which is three basic points I would elaborate further. Uh, but the three points are in direct answer to the uh, problem of legitimacy that we're um, trying to innovate and to solve. Uh, and the three uh, pillars of the compact are, um, first, a voluntary association. I work with the government, uh, for the government. I don't give nor take command. All I do is facilitate, make suggestions, uh, receive fear, uncertainty, and doubts, and do some facilitative work. And the second thing is radical transparency. So literally everything that I'm a chair of in the meeting, in the cabinet, uh, we publish the entire transcript uh, 10 working days after each um, convention. And it's the same for lobbying and for journalists and for anyone who come to me. During my office hour every Wednesday here, I'm uh, in that place from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Anyone can come to talk with me as long as they agree for the radical transparency. And the third thing is location independence. Uh, so anywhere I, on us, I'm still doing my job. And this, it, this enables, of course, to have creative offices like this, but also enables a lot of uh, regional innovation where I just go to a place and do some ethnographic 
like uh, thing, <laughs> like uh, investigative reporter uh, kind of thing uh, in a population and in a very rural or indigenous places. But meanwhile, having the 12 or so ministries uh, in the social innovation lab to see through my eyes, how is it like uh, in the field out there and for the people in the field to have a real-time conversation uh, with the 12 ministries involved in the National Social Innovation Plan. So those three taken together, I think, form a, a legitimacy system that was initially prototyped uh, during the Occupy. Um, the Occupy, for people who uh, don't know about it, uh, was four years ago now, uh, in 2014, where people occupied the parliament in Taiwan because the MPs were kind of on strike. They did not wish to deliberate substantially a cross-strait Service and Trade Act, or a CSSTA, and because the MPs were sort of on strike, people just went to the parliament and did the MPs' job for them, namely deliberating the uh, trade service agreement. Uh, and what they do uh, is the demo, but in a demo in the sense of a you know demo scene, not a demonstration, a purely protest. So for 22 days or so, people were just there, and also around the different street corners, there's about 20 NGOs deliberating each and every aspect of the CSSTA, and I was part of the people in the Sunflower Revolution, but not as taking any of those 20 or so sides, but rather as part of the movement called Gap Zero, which, um, as the moderator already uh, introduced, uh, is the community that calls to fork the government, which was started in 2012, uh, uh, two years before the Occupy. And this is a very simple hack. Uh, you can do it yourself here. Uh, any government website in Taiwan ends in gov.tw. And the idea, very simply put, is that if you don't like, for example, the legislative uh, website, you can just do an alternative by changing the O to a zero on the browser bar. And so that solves the discoverability problem. So any public service, by changing O to a zero, you get into the shadow government, uh, which does the same thing, except with more interactive, more open data. And people participating in this movement relinquish their copyright so that by the next procurement cycle, we see a lot of of zero innovations, like the first one was the vi budget visualization and having each budget item a conversation board uh, that actually gets merged this year. So all the 1,300 uh, ministerial projects become a social object upon which you can have a real dialogue with the public service and things like that. So all this is a forking the government, but it's also systematically merging it back. So Gov zero is supporting the communication for the Sunflower Occupy throughout the 22 days. And we see something very interesting happening. We see that with this kind of radical transparency, with the location independence, wh wherever you are, you can be part of the conversation. And with this kind of voluntary association, people just cross-pollinate the different uh, points around CSSTA so that over three weeks, people converge rather than diverge, as some other occupies do. Um, so we converged uh, eventually on a set of uh, very accurate demands, and which the head of parliament then accepts. And so the occupy was successful. And so that was kind of our first demo. but. After that, we've just been scaling these conversations so that it doesn't take an Occupy to start a conversation like this, but actually something the public service is comfortable of doing it themselves. So that's the kind of the legitimacy crisis and the innovation that was brought up to solve the legitimacy crisis. Uh, so, so I want to push you just on this. Yes. This is very interesting that whereas for, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here, I'll grab the bad mic. Let's see. Is that, that let's see if I can make that work. Better. Um, is uh, obviously Zuccotti Park, the Occupy movement here, the Occupy movement uh, in the, the related social movements were not as successful. Um, there's clearly some vision that you had or that others had or that coalesced that caused you to develop some really concrete proposals to move forward. Would you say it was a, a, a particular vision for democracy that sort of was the cause? Or what was really, why did this work and those didn't, would you say? I think we kind of benefited from, uh, you know, seeing the other occupants around. And also from the uh, two years between the Gov Zero uh, has founded uh, to the Occupy. So there, there's two years of civic tech people basically trying to turn uh, collectivism into something that is more agenda setting, which we call hacktivism. Mm. Uh, and we do it, obviously, through um, sharing of open data, turning data into social objects, uh, through having a good um, you know, social sphere where people can ask questions without getting burdened by trolls and things like that. So there's a strong um, kind of um, 
deliberative quality to the spaces that GovZero has been building since 2012 to 2014. And then after that, of course, we try to have a real conversation with Korea Public Service and try to get a Korea Public Service into the design of such things. And basically, by relinquish the copyright, have the public service take over the maintenance after the initial prototype. And all these, I think, uh, foster a culture that uh, focus on what we call scalable listening or listening at scale, meaning that we get people into the mood of listening, uh, but do it at scale. And so we did not certainly anticipate the Occupy, which is like the, the, you know, the real agenda setting power, but we were just you know, almost there. Uh, and so I think uh, when the Occupy actually happened, there's a lot of ready-made systems uh, for, you know, crowd um, transcript, for crowd live streaming, for a lot of uh, different collection of opinions, for visualizing them in clusters, for uh, getting the each line in the CSSTA, you just have to enter your company number or your company serial number, and then it shows exactly which paragraph of CSSTA affects you in a kind of comic uh, kind of way that everybody understands and things like that. And all of these are ready when the Occupy happened, and so we kind of just plug it in into the Occupy's uh, movement. So to have you know half a million of people on the street using the system that previously only maybe five thousand people was using. Mm. And I'm just I just want to push one more a little bit further on this because so many of the other uh, public engagement platforms that have be, that have been developed by d come growing out of different social movements. And here I'm thinking about our friends in Spain, mm -hmm. who have chosen to go a different path, which is what we might think of as radical direct democracy. Mm -hmm. So their view is they want to be Switzerland. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be Switzerland, mm -hmm. and I'm curious why not. Well, we're not Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Neither yeah. is Spain, but... Uh, <laughs> right. Um, I, I don't know too much about direct democracy because Taiwan just at the end of this year is going to have the first substantial referendum. Uh, I think there's nine or ten topics uh, waiting for referenda. But even in our new revised uh, referendum act, there's a strong um, emphasis on the deliberative quality before mm -hmm. the uh, referendum is actually cast. I think part of it is, is culture because in, in Taiwan we, we can talk about, for example, consensus and people visualize, uh, you know, things with consensus statements uh, and divisive statements and we can uh, say with a straight face that uh, you know um, online discussion after a while in a safe enough space always uh, produces consensus but that's because the social norm already values consensus and it may be just in a rough consensus kind of way but we are reasonably sure that it always ends up with something like that, with the right space design. And you probably cannot say that in many other uh, places on Earth. So, so this is, I think, a defining characteristic that we always want to converge on something and it's seen as a positive social value, even among people who disagree bitterly. So you've created this whole ecosystem now of tools and culture for digital listening and deliberation. And I'm wondering, I know that everybody is super eager, at least I think you should all be super eager to get to the demo and to see the details here. But I'm wondering if you can, before we dive too deeply into the mechanics of any one platform, give us the overview about the different pieces in this vision and how they're connected um, and whether they came one at a time or sprung whole cloth from your head and that of your colleagues. What are the components in this kind of ecosystem that have cre begun to create this new culture? That's right. So uh, if we consider the Occupy as, you know, people really going in and thinking really deeply about one singular social issue, um, the difficulty usually lies in asking the right question, like how may we move forward to find some common value. And so uh, using standard <laughs> design thinking terminology, we can <laughs> separate <laughs> these uh, into kind of four different phases, uh, where the first is the crowd um, fact-finding, the um, checking of feelings, uh, the kind of getting to a point where people think these are the objective facts that we can all agree on. And then just by listening in to people's feelings, we have a a month or so uh, dedicated in each topic just to for people to check in on each other's feelings. And visualization technology certainly helps a lot here because if you can see your Facebook or Twitter friends uh, relative position in a crowdsourced um, you know, uh, map, then people can actually relate much more because it's all your friends and families who just didn't talk about this uh, particular issue over at dinner. And so they are not nameless enemies. They are people who you can have a real conversation with and discover. And all this 
this is not done by a preset questionnaire, but rather by people uh, sharing their authentic feelings and for other people to uh, rate whether they resonate uh, or not with the feelings. And so this feeling stage, I think, is very important, the reflective stage. And of course, after we uh, get a set of uh, reflective rough consensus, the ideation uh, begins. But now we have a clear goal, because the best idea are the one that takes care of most people's feelings. And finally, uh, the parliamentary system or the administrative system steps in and makes decisions by essentially ratifying the ideas into a coherent decision. And so this objective, reflective, interpretive, and de decisional uh, stages came out of a Canada um, research uh, called Focus Conversation Method. And it's broadly speaking the stages that we use for public um, consultations, the public multi-stakeholder discussions like this. And so now tell us about the tech and how all of okay. this gets. So uh, soon? So soon? Should I? I can't, I, can't, I can't wait. I have too many. I'm going to come back to all my other democratic theory questions okay. in a moment. And let me just interrupt again to say if folks in the back want to, there are seats over here on the side. Please feel free to come up and, uh, and join us. But they look, they look comfy back there. Okay. We can talk back. about the tech. Okay. All right. So um, that or you can or you can over you can override me. I, the, uh, no, it's just fine. No, I, I think the tech is 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 worth uh, looking about because um, it it really uh, the reflective part was was the hardest part. Uh, how do we get people with no face to face uh, experience together to resonate with each other on feelings instead of you know just polarizing and trolling each other with cat pictures or whatever? Um, and and so that was kind of the the missing piece that we were. Um, looking for, and fortunately, there's some startups in Seattle uh, solving exactly that, uh, and it, that's the POLIS uh, system, which is the first um, crowd feeling checking system that we tried. We tried dozens of them. It's the first one that actually worked. Uh, and so back in 2015, uh, the topic at the time was um, UberX, and UberX, uh, as you you know, is this meme called sharing economy, but uh, the payload actually means that you know code dispatch cars better than loss, so we need to obey code not loss. Uh, that's more or less its payload back in 2015, and and so just like any virus of the mind, it spreads through the interactions from drivers to passengers to driver to passengers, and it actually is a uh, meme in the pure sense that uh, if a driver after driving for a couple of weeks found it's not a very good deal after all, they will have already infected uh, people, and that uh, basically leads to a polarization of people. And so uh, using this kind of consultation, what we think is a kind of vaccination of the mind, so that after people confirm each other's feelings, it may become much harder for people to be polarized by uh, one-sided PR messages. And so this checking in each other's feelings is done simply by people um, you know, looking at one sentiment or another, clicking, I resonate with this or not, and see their evidence are move uh, among the clusters formed by the, the similar-minded people. Uh, but there's two things that's worth mentioning. First, we're not looking at the numbers at all. These numbers mean nothing. So this just <laughs> um, basically measure the diversity of the sentiment at the moment. And anyone can just override by proposing something that's more nuanced, more eclectic, that resonates with more people. And the second is that basically there's no reply button, so you cannot really troll someone here. Uh, and so that's the two secret sauce, so to speak. <laughs> and, and so we send that link to all the drivers and passengers and unions and whatever. And after three weeks, weeks as I said, they came out with this very strong consensus statement, just like we did uh, during the Occupy. And the thing that happened afterward, the tech, was the live streaming uh, of the meetings between the stakeholders. And we uh, bind ourselves to use only the consensus statements as the agenda for the meeting and checking in the consensus resonant fe feelings one by one with the stakeholders. Do you agree? And if you don't, why not? And just by you know committing their words in a live stream way, transcribe and so on, people can refer to that transcription as the social object. And so that leads to the much easier ratification because people cannot easily go back on the statements they have uh, when they know that thousands of people are watching the live stream and the agenda was done by those same people uh, who formed over the course of three weeks uh, through live stream. And so that is the, the UberX case, but we did maybe um, 26 or so cases uh, this way uh, before I became the digital minister, and that's the the V-Taiwan process in a nutshell. So that's the V. So that's the V-Taiwan process. A couple of questions. Tell us something about who's participating mm -hmm. here, and V-Taiwan over the course of those 26 pieces mm -hmm. of legislation that have been developed have engaged about 200,000 people. Is that number about that's right, correct? That's right. If you count people watch live stream or. 
and or in polis because it's very low threshold. All you have to do is just click a bunch of agree or disagree. So how do you sort of yeah. evaluate who, from your own reflection on it, uh, 200,000 is a pretty big number, but Taiwan has 23 million people, right? That's right. So it's still a fairly low number. That's right. Who are mm -hmm. those people who are participating? Are you satisfied with who has participated? Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about who those individuals are, how you got them a little bit, and, and where the, mm -hmm. um, and why you think it wasn't more. Right, so uh, V Taiwan, as I said, is mostly about like getting this thing, this how may we thing right. Uh, it doesn't even talk about the ideation and decision making, which is like the follow up uh, statement that each ministry has. So what we focus on in this point is very much uh, what we call a diversity in stakeholders. So for UberX, of course, we have to talk to unions, to various different taxi companies, to Uber itself, to the various um, horizontal groups that's formed around this particular issue. For Airbnb, it's a very different population. Uh, for um, anything that's related to digital economy, for example, for uh, the privacy protection and so on, is a, a, a bunch of very different people and so on. And so there is no constituency of Taiwan. It is mostly just people, um, you know, sharing pizza and food and whatever uh, every every Wednesday <laughs> uh, in the social innovation lab, <laughs> and and basically over dinner uh, think about things that they would like. Um, the public to talk about and also invite the various ministries and agency people to join in on those PISA discussions and over the course I think the Uber one we got I think three months or so before we even agree on the name of the title of the consultation we eventually settled on uh, you know um, riding a, a a car uh, driven by someone with no professional license and charging over it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that kind of absolutely neutral um, uh, sentence was, was basically formed over many months of uh, stakeholder gatherings, which the stakeholders who participated in this eventually went back to them, uh, their communities and spread this questionnaire and these uh, online engagement forms. So it is very much a s stakeholder conversation um, platform, much like the Internet Society or other standard making association rather than trying to build ourselves as something that has a, a power of a referendum. So we're very much not on this stage. We're very much just on the, you know, ID, the fact checking and the feeling checking stage. And that was the V Taiwan position, and which is why it's seen as a, a complementary um, to hierarchical power or to representative democracy, but not reinforcing it, just complementing it. Just complementing it. But it was a very deliberate decision to start with that component of the problem as opposed to uh, instituting a citizen jury or something that used sortition or a random selection of a representative sample of people. Uh, you may know Jim Fishkin's work out of Stanford. It's, he's the granddaddy of this field who said it's only legitimate. We're going to get you know, a representative sample of the population, 400 people together in a room, uh, and measure their opinion. Why start here? Well, it is not very clear to me that once you get after the sortition, that these people will actually carry out the deliberation back to their communities to share their, um, you know, sampled statistic uh, um, characteristics. Mm. That's the first one. And the second is that even if it's statistically fair, some people are just better orators than, than other people, better at rhetorics, better at, you know, convincing other people given a limited amount of time. So it, it was not at all clear to us that we should start with a representative sampling. Of course, if you want this decisional part to be informed by such um, sortition-based sampling, we do have some of that here uh, going on in Taiwan, but it, it is more of in the ideation and decisional processes and not at all in the you know, first two phases. So these two are kind of disconnected. They can be connected by a shared how may we question, but when we started, we were not entirely sure that we should uh, start with a random sortition, mostly because first there's no culture for it, there's no jury system in Taiwan. We're just starting to introduce one. Uh, so it's kind of experimental, so people don't have any prior experience to sortition. And the second thing is that we want to make this really lightweight so that any city public servant can run it by themselves, and sortition is kind of expensive compared to this me mechanism. And how? How much does this cost, by the way? 
zero dollars. <laughs> yeah. Who pays uh, for the pizza? <laughs> yeah, who pays for the pizza? Um, so, so we had a donation box after each meeting. People just chiming with coins and whatever. So, so it is all very much crowdfunded huh? uh, uh, of the people who show up for the pizza. Uh, but, but yeah, really, the government what what the government does is essential essentially two things. First, to agree to appear on the pre meetings, uh, sending the people from the right agency, and finally, after the how many question and the reflections are synthesized to reply point by point and that's the two main commitments and they don't cost anything uh, from the government agencies point so of view. for an anarchist a self-proclaimed anarchist yeah. you are uh, uh, you are remarkably concerned with government involvement and what government thinks I'm concerned with public servants <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about uh, how you have engaged public servants how you've gotten them to participate uh, what, that the getting incentives? them to the table may yeah. be even mm -hmm. harder than getting the pizza eaters into the room. So I'm really curious what has been, um, how you convinced, how you've convinced public servants to participate, and importantly, how you really had the idea that that was as crucial that it is. I, I agree with you completely, but it's surely not a universally held view. Um, it's it's uh, the, the, their key to the equation. And you've clearly been bringing government in. And look, you yourself went into government, so it would be wonderful to kind of figure out why that happened. Uh, did you take a wrong turn? Mm. Uh, 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 or how did, you, how did you end up in government and then being so good at convincing government yeah. to become part of this process? So yeah, I, I think, uh, first of all, during the Occupy, the legitimacy or people's approval rating of the central administration was at 9%. So it's not exactly 2%, but it's dangerously close. <laughs> uh, so, so that is a time when the entire public administration kind of lost legitimacy. Uh, and also, at the end of that year of the Occupy, every mayor who was did not support Occupy lost the mayoral election. And the mayors who did support the Occupy sometimes found themselves mayors without preparing the inauguration speech. Uh, and so <laughs> this is also something that happened in Spain, actually. So um, I think that that is the time, a kind of moment um, in, in democracy where the people in the public service very much did not want another Occupy. And, and so, which is why the new premier at the time, at the end of 2014, just invited the, the neutrals uh, during the Occupy, uh, the facilitators, the communicators, the, the people who work with all the different 20 different NGOs, essentially as mentors or advisors to the public service. And I remember the first uh, few lectures I gave uh, was to, there was three lectures to 100 people each, and they're rank 12, almost the highest rank in the career public service. There's exactly 300 such people in the Taiwan administration, uh, in, in all the different city, different branches in, in the government. And all those 300 officials of rank 12 basically so through the three-hour <laughs> lecture on how V-Taiwan works and how the Occupy technologies work and how to communicate with people. And I found that most of them are actually very much pro this kind of conversation. Mostly because in career public service, the deal was, was pretty bad. Because if things go right, the minister takes all the credit. And if things go wrong, you take all the blame. And so, <laughs> of course, people don't innovate in, in such um, circumstances. But they found that there's something in it for them for radical transparency. Because if there's good ideas, even during the pizza eating stage, uh, people discover about how professional they are and also how truly concerned they are for the public welfare. And you don't usually see that because you see that only after the minister takes or rejects uh, their proposals. And second, it really reduced the risk because if you communicate with the people who would have been on the street but now is willing to go to the social innovation lab, then there's much less risk for everybody else involved. So more credit, less risk, also less work. So why not? So that is why after which I trained another 1,000 or so public servants of lower ranks uh, in the actual nuts and bolts of doing this. And so let's, sticking with V-Taiwan for a minute, and I want to come back and ask you about the lab and the rest yeah, of this sure. ecosystem. Um, it, talk to us a little bit about the impact from your perspective. So 26 pieces of legislation, 200,000 people participating. How would you describe the impact, both in terms of individuals, in terms of the institutions, in terms of society? Are those laws better laws as a result of this? And how do you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, this is a, a very fair question. Um, I, I would, uh, of course, I 
yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, I, I would. So th this was the, the the old interface. It's more colorful, but less legible. Um, but I, I would say that the, the V Taiwan um, is a kind of existential proof to everybody involved that this is possible. Uh, but at the time, um, the Uber case for, uh, in particular, I think there's three notable omissions. First is that we, the civic hackers, did all of this ourselves. We did not actually involve. Oops, where did? I think it went to sleep or something. So, yeah, we just hit a key and it may wake up, or it may not. No, it's fine. It will come back. So yeah, so here we go. Yeah, so um, at the time, the civic hacker ran everything and did not involve the career public service um, in the preparation. And so I think that is why it did not actually scale into city level or municipal level because while everybody see that this is obvious working, um, the exactly how to make it work is not exactly common knowledge to the public service, especially on a municipal level. That's the first thing. And the second thing was that uh, when we did this experiment. Um, Uber was only operating in northern Taiwan, in Taipei and Kaohsiung and so on. And so we did not invite taxi drivers from the south southern Taiwan that will go back to Honda's because the legitimacy was simply not there. Uh, and the uh, third thing, finally, is that uh, people keep in this conversation want to uh, broaden the scope to talk about platform economy in general, but not uh, you know UberX or ride sharing in particular. Um, and we should have uh, gone with that. Uh, and that also came back to haunt us <laughs> because then we'll have to do it case, case by case for each and every case is after that. And so we, we remedied some of that after I become the digital minister. But I think what prevented V Taiwan from really going into all the municipal uh, places was it, it's very cutting edge. The people who do it did not actually do it with the um, Korea Public Service um, in tandem. Uh, it is kind of seen as kind of a plug-in or a oracle in computer science uh, speak where you can just plug in and it gives you a good uh, resonating consensus, but it is very much a black box uh, from the Korea Public Service point of view. So they, they may accept that there is no little risk in doing this and also that it also saves them time um, amortized, but otherwise um, I don't think it became really, really popular because the public service at that time still did not ha know how to operate it independent of those civic hackers. Does that explain the, I think somewhere you or someone else has said that 20% of the, the deliberations that have happened on Beach Taiwan have not uh, led to decisive government action? Yeah. Is that, is that not, not, not really, because there's only one case that people reached a consensus and that did not get turned into law, um, and that's the online liquor sales case. But in every other case, I think the consensus was respected, and sometimes it did not lead to action because uh, the collective consensus was we don't need a law for it or we don't need new laws for it. The cyberbullying one for, for in particular, uh, after various rounds of discussions, people, people generally think bullying has existing laws to um, work with it. And so what we should do is basically uh, have a foundational law that treats online behaviors in the same way as offline behaviors. And in cases where the metaphor doesn't hold, uh, provide bridging clauses for it to hold, but not to treat cyberbullying as a different thing as bullying. And so people generally agreed to not have a special cyberbullying law, which was the original ask. So in many cases, people deliberated and after a few months decided that maybe the best course of action is not governmental action, but actually action from the social sector and the civil society and the private sector uh, to build new norms. And that cases, I think, account for most of the 20% where it did not lead to government action. And would you, in, in your wildest dreams, does every piece of government action go through this process? Um, no. <laughs> and mostly because the getting people on the same page uh, thing is really difficult. Uh, this uh, checking of reflective feelings rests on the 
um, fact that people can look at a description and some crowd source data about you know private um, drivers and charging people for it. Everybody who participate have an idea of what it is like. But if it is too far in the future, for example, if we're deliberating about, I don't know, zero knowledge proofs and data agency based on you know mutual distributed ledger governance systems, uh, then it will require a lot more intuition building before we actually enter the checking of feelings. Or Alternatively, if we're talking about transitional justice of indigenous nations, um, the past vary too wildly so that the same concept don't even hold its same currency uh, in people's mind who are came from those 16 different indigenous nations in Taiwan. And so the transitional justice process, we can't just say, you know, go use the VTOM process because the basic empathy, the basic vocabulary have to be built before even the facts can be considered. So if it's too far in the future, too far in the past, or it's a mixture of between, I don't think this actually is the best practice. And so tell us a little bit if we can do it without apologies for the visuals, um, although we can we could try to troubleshoot them in parallel. Um, I want to ask you about the rest of the ecosystem. I mean, I'm sure there will be lots more questions that I haven't asked yet or we haven't had time to cover on the V Taiwan mechanics, but I don't want to run out of time to really talk about the broader the sort of the, the 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 role that the lab plays, the role that some of the other pieces, which I won't give away, I'll let you tell us. Okay, sure. Um, so all, all that was kind of up to mid 2016 before I, I got the this post of digital minister, and so after I got this into this post, it was this compact of three clauses. Uh, my main aim uh, in the public digital innovation space that we set up was mostly just to get a career public service the confidence of running these processes by themselves. Uh, and the platform we chose was uh, the join platform, which is at once a uh, e petition e-petition platform and a regulatory pre-announcement platform and the budget discussion platform that I just showed the people about. You can fill it in your head. So <laughs> it is basically you look at one piece of the budget. You don't like how it's being used. You can petition uh, for it. After you collect 5,000 um, electronic signatures, the government is committed into answering it substantially and then hopefully leading to new regulations which gets pre-announced on the same platform and then you can then have a discussion also online with public service. Um, but the e-petition part, when I became the digital minister, um, it, it, it's really pretty good for things that pertains to one single ministry or one single agency. But it's spectacularly bad if it, uh, it is uh, cross-ministerial. And, and that is because no ministry want to answer for the other ministries. So if it concerns three different ministries, each ministry just you know, use a lot of words, dutiful reply to explain why this is um, you know, respectively not their business, their business, and their business. Uh, and so th th it's pretty bad. Uh, and so um, the first thing we did uh, after I became Digital Minister is to set up a team of what we call participation officers or POs in each and every ministry and have them form a virtual team so that because it's just basic game theory if you're going to interact with the same bunch of people for the next four years then you better collaborate but if previously it's different people every time. So that now when people do a petition in Taiwan, they know even if it's cross-ministerial, even when people petition for, for example, in South Taiwan, there's people petitioning for, um, you know, stationing helicopters to serve as ambulance cars because they are uh, too far away from a ma major hospital. And it could be solved by depositing the helicopter, which would be the Ministry of Interior, or by building faster roads, which would be transportation, or building a large hospital there, which would be health and welfare, and or, you know, doing more, I don't know, relocation of population, uh, you know, making the, tur uh, actually there's national defense there th as well, because there's a defense base there, a air base there. So it could be solved in like five different ways. And what prevented this idea from being fully explored was that previously there was no virtual network of such participation officers to fully all go to that town of Hengchun and make sure that uh, everyone, yay, it's back. To, to make sure that um, everyone is on the same page and also make sure that, making sure that, uh, yeah, it's almost there. You can, if you can just open QuickTime and um, start a recording, and then we may actually go back to showing the visuals. Um, right. Um, yeah. 
I can help. Yes. Right. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's okay if you start mirroring and then start QuickTime and new video. Can I help? Obviously, you should feel free to just raise your hand, but you can also send questions in via Twitter, and we'll try to take them by both modalities. So if you're watching this live streaming, by all means, send hashtag IPK, uh, and then for people in the room, you can have your choice, uh, have, have your cake and eat it too. Right, so uh, let Thank me just you. take a couple of minutes. Uh, so these are the participation officers. And every month we meet and vote and talk about questions that requires cross-ministerial support. And here are the petitioners. And just by petitioning, they automatically get invitation to such collaboration workshops, which are, if they want, uh, live streams so that people can also participate over the internet. And it's not um, just one collaborative meeting. Uh, for example, the tax system case, it was like four subsequent meetings where people just co collaboratively co-created the tax exporting uh, reporting system. Or in the Hongchen case I just talked about, uh, it's literally um, like all the different ministries and all the different local stakeholders. And the reason why we can get all the different ministries was that in the participation officer uh, um, regulation, uh, all these are national regulations and the e-participation regulation, we said that whenever there's more than one owning agencies and each considering um, each other, um, you know, owning it and they only want to support it, everybody owns it and they all have to go to where the people are. And so we went there, took five hours, explore every single options using the policy lab methodology of mind mapping. And so basically explore all the different options before uh, setting on the insight that we should actually retain people's trust on their local hospitals. And so we really should build a larger hospital after exploring all the different options. And so um, that, that was like every other Friday. And so next Monday, after each collaboration meeting, I bring this synthetic document into the premier uh, meeting uh, with the premier and other ministers and, and say, say, you know, whether the premier is okay with it. And once the premier is okay with it, then of course, after a couple of weeks, the hospital just gets the budget and it gets built. So it's a very quick turnaround system from people surfacing there is a local or a national issue to the participation officers crowding in and to make all the different solutions palpable, understandable, and then the people getting a consensus and the premier actually gives blessing to the cases. So using this new e-petition driven method, we handle another 40 cases. This is in parallel with the V-Taiwan um, service and about half of which has led to a new budget or a new policy or so on. And the other half, again, is not because of inaction, it's because after thoroughly discussing whether Taiwan should change its time zone to plus nine, um, people decided maybe it's not the best idea after all. So it did not actually get changed to plus nine. Well, I mean, it's the Korea Public Service doing all this preparation, right? We're just facilitating and providing the, the missing proficiencies. And even at that, the facilitative, the recording, um, the, you know, translational um, proficiencies, we make sure that it's all transferred back into the public service. So, of course, they will insist on that because it's them running the show. And that's the first thing. And the second is that we also leave room for reflections, like in the Hong Chun case with helicopters. Um, we, we use two rooms, a uh, smaller room. Uh, about 20 people uh, of just like this of people doing co-creation and discussion and so on uh, but a larger room uh, that can fit hundreds of people 
actually a town hall, in the town hall, uh, is where we watch the live stream together. And the, the digital minister is in the town hall and with the people watching the live stream in a smaller room and serving as a kind of ESPN anchor uh, to explain what this slide means, what this move means, and, and whatever, and making sure that people who want to vent, who want to protest, and whatever, they can just come to me because the media is on the town hall, obviously, while the professionally, neutrally facilitated high-performance meeting is happening concurrently. So people won't protest for very long because everybody want to watch the movie. And also because it's not live streamed back, so all the protest, all the shouting doesn't actually inf affect the deliberation that's happening in a smaller room. On the other hand, any new point they make that's in relation with the mind map is tagged and brought back through Slido, through other digital tools, so that people there can also see the outside people's contributions, but always within the context of the mind map that they're doing the mapping. So what's the experiment you next want to try? What haven't you done yet? Uh, and is it scaling Is it scaling what you've done or trying something new or both? Yeah, so uh, there's a mayoral election coming soon and we are already getting some interest and commitments from both existing mayors and mayoral candidates of basically taking this system, which is national regulation, and into city and municipal level so that they would want to try this not just for participatory budgeting, of which there's many, but uh, also on, well, crowd law, on a city level. And we're also seeing a lot of interest because Taiwan is now doing a lot of experiments on what we call sandboxes. Um, which is um, this idea of people experimenting with breaking the law for a year or so. Uh, and I think this is worth sharing because um, this is essentially us encouraging people who want to do platform economy or so so that's our kind of final solution it's just to for people who want to break the law to do platform economy or fintech or later this year uh, UVs and the UVs could be hybrids um, to just break the law for a year <laughs> and and basically work with any willing municipalities they can break the law for a year basically running with a forked version of the law they would wish the government had set up in place and after running it for a year we use a you know this kind of consensus gathering mechanism to make sure that the whole society think this alter this fork is a good idea, and if it's not a good idea, well, we thank the investor for paying the tuition for everyone. But uh, otherwise, <laughs> and reduce the risk for everybody else afterwards. But otherwise, it may be extended to a larger scope, including a business model for another year. And if it's a regulatory change, it would just happen if people deem this a good idea. And if this requires a law change, then um, it, it's up to four years uh, when the MPs deliberate on that, uh, in which the you know people applying for a sandbox just essentially gets a monopoly in that municipality in this kind of business um, experiments. So a lot of uh, the, the steps that we're now taking is basically empowering the municipalities to be able to run this kind of process when they uh, do with a sandbox uh, application and evaluate its applicability to the local uh, social good and social needs. All right, I'll do one more for me and then I'll save the rest of mine until we get a chance for everyone else to come in. So, it, so I have to ask because everybody always asks me about the risks. Uh, with the introduction of and the moving of so much of, of democratic life in your vision online, how do we square that with the dangers of people always ask about of surveillance, of privacy, the risk as we look at what China is doing with regard to social credit scoring and potentially rating people and using that score to determine whether you're allowed to have a political voice, what do you perceive to be the greatest risks in this process or is it all upside? We're all very wary about vendor lock-in. Uh, when we first use Polis for, for the UberX discussion, there's a lot of flack from the civic community because it was proprietary. And even though that uh, Colin and friends running police said that they will share all the data, we have no way to know whether they're actually sharing all the data. Uh, and they're, they're really just a Seattle startup. And, and so basically, we, we don't know what is the data policy uh, like. And we kind of took the bet, but we also peer pressure a lot for them to go, you know, Afro GPL, which is one of the most, um, you know, uh, Libra uh, version of open source licenses, and also making sure that we can host it uh, locally and basically have the, everybody to be part of the governance system that makes sure that this 
mechanism of democracy is itself democratic in the sense that its code, its data, its operation is community owned. And after I became the digital minister, of course, I took this philosophy into my office. So um, basically, we built this sandstorm uh, installation, which is again a another startup, uh, but uh, it's all open source, and we get our cybersecurity people to audit it. And what this does is basically a sandbox system in a uh, computer uh, science sense. It boxes the apps that runs on top of it so that they don't have to worry about cybersecurity authentication authorization and whatnot and we can use all open source technologies for collaborative um, decision making or just note taking or whatever on top of this platform and our career public service can even just learn some JavaScript and write a you know small application for ordering lunch boxes together or planning trips together that actually happened uh, and running on this uh, platform without worrying about cybersecurity about infiltration about surveillance and whatever because the code itself um, being audited and open source is a collective resource managed by the entire worldwide civitech community of which Taiwan is just one installation of many. Okay, I won't monopolize any longer. You do have one, uh, uh, an initial question coming on Twitter, but I'm going to look for a show of hands in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask if you don't mind to also pull up the hashtag because my battery's about to die. Mm -hmm. so I may Thank you so much for your input. I got to ask in the in the age of fake news, what's what's the role of journalism in your project and and moving forward or what has been the role of journalism and how do you envision the role of journalism moving forward? Right. Um, so I, I don't use the, the F word uh, myself. Uh, I prefer to call them disinformation when they're intentional and misinformation when they're not. Um, and as a kind of not an affront to journalists. Both of my parents were journalists. Uh, so anyway, um, so uh, I, I found that radical transparency is, is really empowering uh, investigative journalism and just quality journalism in general. Because a lot of journalists' work is just to, you know, get the scoop uh, from the ministers. But when a minister basically published everything and agreed to no exclusive interviews, um, everybody is on the same ground. And when a lobbyist come, like uh, Mr. Plouffe here, uh, talking uh, for Uber at a time, uh, we make sure that it's not just on transcript uh, record, but actually on 360 recording. So any journalist can put on VR goggles and <laughs> relive the, the moment of, of the negotiation. Um, and I think I think this is very powerful in a sense that once everybody gets the same facts, the, the journalists with perspective, with uh, time for investigation, with um, you know it, their own life experience to bring to the table, um, can produce much more powerful uh, pieces, uh, but still within the time frame uh, of that uh, still attracts uh, popular attention. But without these uh, raw materials being made available, their life is much harder because they have to compete with short-term um, attention and also try to get some sort of information out there. But it is much higher chance because they're raising essentially with the tabloidic um, you know, journalism um, and to, to produce something and then it will contain more misinformation in it and which will um, you know, reduce the quality of your reporting. So yeah, the investigative journalists I think are really our friend and in PETAS there, were, there are also my colleagues who uh, during the Occupy ran the e-forum which is uh, the neutral journalism um, outlet of during the Occupy. So it's very much on our mind that what we're doing is basically investigation, investigative work for journalism, but in a uh, minister's post uh, within the cabinet. And this kind of reliable um, information is also when Taiwan is, you know, there's a lot of disinformation campaigns, especially now we're this close to election, and the administration is committing to basically replying to all the spreading of disinformation in a timely, open, structured fashion, so that every ministry uh, can reply within like three hours or four four hours, whenever there's a disinformation campaign, there's a clarification from the ministry. But we're, we're not censoring speech at all, right? What we're doing is ensuring that people get this habit of waiting a couple hours and then see whether a clarification came out from the administration. That's all, all we're doing, basically defining a social norm around rapid response and reasonable uh, disclosure from the ministries.
Thank you. Uh, so my, my question is about, you mentioned uh, empathy earlier and how you know, this approach doesn't uh, make a lot of sense for issues that are longstanding, deeply held lack of information on different sides. So my question is whether you have explored any other approaches for establishing that kind of empathy between different parties, or if you think that it just the, the problems are so complex and long-lasting that they, frankly, just should fall outside of the remit of a, of a digital ministry. Yeah. So um, there is the Holopolis project, which um, is now taking place, I think, in Madrid. They're, they're setting up a lab there. Uh, but it, it started in, in Taiwan, and it, it was initially a, my kind of research uh, proposal. Um, I was just working on it when they told me that they want me to be the digital minister. Uh, but in any case, um, the idea, very simply put, is to use augmented and mixed and virtual reality to make sure that people have some lived in experience of one another before entering a discussion if it's too far in the past. For things too far in the future, for example, when building a hypothetical, I don't know, um, airport or whatever, at least we can take those blueprints from the architects and situate people in future versions of that airport and actually feel how it is like uh, to be maybe a non-human because um, for endangered species, we can also look at their lived-in experience as well. Uh, and I did a VR um, conversation with a bunch of school children who all very much appreciate that I uh, scale down my avatar to be the same height as them, uh, like they could be at eye level. <laughs> uh, and, and there's a lot of design that, that went into this very carefully to make sure that people can be literally in each other's shoes or avatars. Uh, and also that there is um, meaningful use of chatbot that can go back and forth uh, on this um, you know, lifting experience to simulate a kind of conversation you would have if, for example, the spirits lived there, the, <laughs> the spirit of the river, the spirit of the endangered species, the spirit of, uh, is a little bit animist even, but we, we've found that it is actually very effective in getting people into the mindset of listening uh, to um, social objects that cannot speak for themselves, uh, future generations, right, and, and things like that. So yeah, there is a lot of active research, but mostly it's now done uh, by my other colleagues who are actually interaction designers in PETAs and not me personally. So I'm just talking about their work. But if you're interested, join the Holopolis project. Hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering, you know, m you're describing how, in, in the case of Taiwan, um, Occupy movement, right? It's part of a network social movement. There was network social movements all across the world in the last six years, and some have gained, um, been more ambitious or successful, quote unquote. I would challenge how we read and understand success because I think these are new kinds of social movements. But one question I have is like, you didn't have the opportunity necessarily to embed these civic deliberation tech uh, methodologies into a political campaign, right? Because it sounded, it sounds like, like, the ministries were like scared, <laughs> right? Um, and kind of opened up space that traditionally social movements would need to like amass space and go run for elections, kind of like what they did, the municipalists did in Spain, right? Um, three years ago. So I'm just wondering, have you given any thought to what, how these processes might look within that context? And um, interested to hear any thoughts you have. Yeah, I think Taiwan's political system is kind of different though. People elect directly the president who appoints the premier and appoints the cabinet. And that is separate from the legislative function. And so actually a majority of bills passed by the legislation starts as the draft from the administrative function. And, and so because of this system, the administration is remarkably party free. Uh, there's more independent ministers at the moment in the cabinet than members of any party in the cabinet. And we can't say that of the legislative function at all. So what, what we're saying is that basically this system pr protects, creates kind of a buf buffer zone for this kind of uh, conversation directly with the population without threatening the legislative. Because if it requires a law change, eventually the MPs will have a say. Party politics will play a role. But just at the feeling finding and the fact finding and consensus finding stage, nobody objects for the career public service to do a little bit more to prepare the MPs better for what people feel, right? So I think this, the administration doing some preparatory work for the eventual referendum or the eventual MPs, uh, 
uh, this is something that everybody can get behind. And because of that, it is like already a very good idea. We don't need to campaign especially hard for that. And rather, people who held some reservations, as I said, lost their mayoral elections anyway in 2014. And so we, we, in our new political landscape, we don't even need to deal with the people who uh, refused this kind of thing. Because in four years ago, they were just all gone. I'm going to ask you a question off of Twitter while people are thinking. Uh, so from Tamash, I, uh, in somewhere, uh, writes, uh, oh, you're here. Ask your question. Yeah. You w no, 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 please. Uh, see, my phone just died, so now you have to ask the question. I, I had to, like yeah, I had to ask the question on Twitter because I Googled join Taiwan, and it was very funny to get the first hits. So if you want to see that, <laughs> yes. go on Twitter. I see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was about uh, uh, the question that Google has as the first hit is, when does China, uh, Taiwan join China? <laughs> Something like that. So um, I had to join that, uh, had to uh, show that. Yeah. The question that I had was, um, was about the risk of public servants. I like how you reframe that as a public servant myself. I see lots of colleagues who are very afraid to to join any participative process. Um, so I was wondering, uh, can they, these people in, in your radical transparent world, can public servants join anonymously in yes. an online world? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah they, they, can be, they can choose any nickname they want and basically kind of anonymize themselves because the transcript is published only after 10 working days of collaborative editing. So people who don't want to some words to be taken out of the context, people who want to add in more supplementary material, people who after reading the transcript actually change their positions, they can all reflect that in the final published version. So the, the upshot of this is that the public sees the career public service as something very professional uh, after reading all these transcripts. And my work in channeling back the you know Reddit equivalents is also make the internet people participation sound very professional because I remove all the exclamation marks and cat pictures uh, and actually only deliver the substance uh, back to the meetings and, and and so I think it really builds mutual trust uh, after you experience this for for a time or two and it really aligns what career public service is like because I think it really reinforces the message of what the values that the career public servants hold without exposing them to personal risk. But if everything turns out very well, we can always re-identify re yourself and take the credit for it. Other comments, questions? Please. Hi, um, my name is Nathan Story. Um, Audrey, it's nice to see you again. I just want to note that um, a few months ago, we were in the same room um, for the Fearless Cities Conference, um, and it was this exact room where you were appearing remotely. Um, and my question is about the role that you see Taiwan playing in these emerging networks of cities from uh, cities and local governments and movements that are forming networks with each other outside of the nation state level, um, and why you are doing that, why you were on a panel in Fearless Cities with counterparts from um, Madrid and, and um, Wikipolitica in, in Mexico, at, uh, an opposition party, and why you are traveling to London and here. What are you trying to accomplish with all of this travel? <laughs> yeah, well, it used to be that it's, it takes paragraphs to, to explain, but now with the excellent technology that is sustainable development goals. Uh, all, all it takes is a few numbers. I'm working on 1718, the 1717, and the 17.6 of the sustainable development goals. And, and we found this to be really effective because digital social innovation in the context of the sustainable goals is really the, the glue that holds people caring about society, caring about environment, caring about education, about equality, about whatever, together in a way that is to the benefit of everybody instead of everybody working on different directions and canceling each other off. And the methodology in the global goals is just to enhance availability of reliable data, of getting people on the same page, literally using distributed ledgers or whatever as needed to make sure that people trust the, the evidences that their um, action is having uh, impacting. 
uh, on the respective domains and encourage effective partnerships by basically building a common vocabulary of sacred law, uh, of a catalog <laughs> of system that people can compare what they're doing within um, their different, very different narratives, but with some metrics that people can, um, you know, uh, amplify their work and compare their work against each other. And finally, to share innovations and technologies so that when we solve this for Taiwan, we know the limitations. But if you're operating it on a different municipality, maybe that uh, limitations don't apply to you and you can extend our vision and do better and we were happy to learn. So this kind of open innovation, I think, is the key to um, getting some sort of solidarity across the different municipalities who are all working on this very same legitimacy problem, but with very different cultural norms. So I think Taiwan's role as um, you know, one of the uh, places where really there is no other choice but innovate without leaving anyone behind, because otherwise the people who get sacrificed just occupy. Um, it, it, is, it is essential <laughs> for us to document and to share uh, our findings, but also work as a um, one of the reliable partners uh, to hold such evidences and such data and such studies and participate in the global network. Um, so you came out in the room and talked that you're an anarchist, and when I think of anarchy, I think of a lot of passion and, and protest, and you know, we see people here protesting on the streets, and, and at the end of the day, nothing really gets done, and you know, what you're doing in Taiwan is, you know, I see a lot of organization there, and it takes a long time. How do you maintain um, that momentum of passion um, that you obviously have? Um, for, for what you're doing and, and with everyone else who's involved, how do you maintain maintain that through through this process? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've wrote entire treaties about this <laughs> back when I was working in the free software community, and it's called optimizing for fun. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of methodologies to basically just celebrate small successes and make things fun and make the fun contagious. And and I think that is the origin of uh, the anarchist uh, thinking for me, because I learned anarchism, of course, from the classic text, but also from the fables and stories of Zhuangzi and, and Laozi in the old Taoist tradition. And they were very much against hierarchical power as well, but they explained their philosophy in a way that is fun, that appeals to even a, you know, I think five-year-old when I first read Taoist text, texts. And, and so it, it's basically very intuitively appealing. And when you maintain this intuitive um, appeal without actually you know, throwing bombs and, and things like that and destroy people who don't agree with the anarchist agenda, you get a, well, I call conservative anarchism, meaning that a anarchist tradition that respect the traditions but don't reinforce them, uh, who work alongside hierarchical power, uh, and shifting them into network making power, but without you know usurping it within the old power logic. I think um, Buckminster Fuller captured it best. Like uh, when you you don't fix a broken system, you make one a new one that makes the old one obsolete, and then that's exactly what we're doing, which is a lot of fun. Um, hi, uh, I'm Rufe, and I currently study the urban informatics. Um, so the like public health and all the healthcare is one of my interesting directions. Um, for example, I think uh, if people go to the hospital, they, the, it's always expensive and time consuming. And I think that is a problem that people like most concerns too. So uh, I wonder in your opinion, how can you, uh, how your ecosystem could address it or help to improve it and or uh, does your ecosystem or e-participation already accumulate some solutions about it? Thank yeah, you. there's a lot of people petitioning and, and working toward digital health. And Taiwan wasn't that big on telehealth uh, before, but there, because of the V-Taiwan uh, methodology, we, we found out a lot of people who want to do e-health, not because they're too far away from a clinic, but rather they want a continuous ongoing relationship with, with their clinicians and so on. So it really surfaced some real needs. And coupled that with the aging uh, issue in Taiwan, there's a rapidly declining population. Uh, 
okay, uh, birth rate, uh, and 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 that we're we're uh, basically having to work with with elders who is much more difficult to actually uh, go to a clinician. Uh, all that uh, resulted in the digital health initiative and the telemedicine bill and whatever of this year. And so uh, this is one of the most popular actually topics in both V Taiwan and also the uh, joint platform. And the joint platform really gets a lot of people really passionate about uh, having the clinicians, the large uh, hospitals doctors, as well as if they're in offshore islands, then the helicopters, the people who actually does the shuffling on the same page using open standards, using the cutting edge technologies such as voice assist assistance to make sure that the elders receive the medical care in the accent, in the culture that they understand, in the words that they understand, using metaphors that they understand, and can also capture their nonverbal non response uh, to such cues and such dialogues in a way that feels comfortable to them is, uh, instead of asking them to speak perfect Mandarin or whatever uh, to get into the system. So, so yeah, that is one very active research agenda. I'm very happy that Vitawan played a very small role in opening up the public imagination into the inevitableness, but also the, the really the urgency of uh, working on uh, digital health. Hello, my name is Marco Konopaki, I'm from Brazil. And I read the Chris Horton's article of, on MIT Technology Review. I don't know if you have the opportunity to read it. And in general, the article says that you have a very ingenious uh, system for crowdsourcing law. But in the end, they say, uh, there is a, a statement that the platform has its limits. It needs real power. And I would like to know what we are doing to get the real power. Is it means uh, what the deep institutional reforms you are thinking or trying to propose to, especially keep these changes uh, continuing uh, during next administrations in Taiwan. Yeah, I think the consensus of the VTAO and community, which I certainly cannot represent, but I can represent um, them, uh, which is um, to scale out, to scale up, and also to scale deep. Uh, and that's the three different directions that the uh, various VTAO and community uh, actors are taking. Scaling out, I already mentioned, meaning that municipalities and city and even smaller communities uh, need to be made, um, you know, comfortable in running this process by themselves without waiting the national government to do it for them. And so, which is why the sandbox experiments and, and so on is so important because it gives something that's pertinent to that particular place to deliberate on without waiting for the central administration to do it for them. So that's scaling out. The scaling up, uh, there's many people who think that v should be coupled with the referendum process or some other process that gives uh, the final binding power a lot more than what we already have at the moment, which is just really consultative power. Um, at the end of this year, there's a national, uh, what we call Digital Communication Act that says for all the things pertaining to digital communication, to internet governance, to multi state stakeholder governance around uh, transnational issues. Uh, something like the VTAO method must be used, and that's the first time that this method, what we call open multi-stakeholder consultation process, is written into the law itself. And that will give the scaling up the binding power uh, that it needs on a national uh, area, but we're still waiting for the legislator's uh, screen light. It will probably happen in a couple months, we'll see. Uh, finally, it's scaling deeply. It's getting this idea into the K-12 uh, curriculum system is for uh, the students to co-create uh, curriculum with the teachers, which is just happening now, and the new curriculum goes um, online next year, uh, where we will redesign the capstone um, classes to make sure that K-12 junior high, senior high, and uh, a college level solve social and environmental problems collectively as part of their learning instead of just uh, you know waiting until they're adults uh, and then participate in this uh, process. Because personally, I'm a junior high school dropout, and my first foray into a democracy is in the internet society. And that was when I was 14, and uh, I've, I've just imbue myself into this um, rough consensus process for six years before I even get my first voting right in rep representative democracy. So I think that kind of formative experience is really important and we really need to scale deeply into the minds of the, the junior high school students who, who will lead the future of the, the direction of the earth anyway.
Okay. I, I saw I have a four. Maybe I uh, no scratch. My apologies. And we have one all the way in the back. That's next. So I, I'm going to focus a little more more practically, I guess. Um, um, my name is Kai Feeder. I work with Beth in her New Jersey capacity as of uh, two and a half weeks ago. Um, <laughs> so uh, when you're looking at, with civil servants in particular that are um, used to very rigid structures uh, and you're engaging them in this very different uh, approach to governance, innovation, et cetera, are there specific types of... Um, characteristics and skills that you think really lead to uh, more successful outcomes uh, that either a attract the civil uh, specific civil servant to get involved into something like this and also help projects succeed internally and be able to navigate within their respective agency or role yeah yeah sure yeah let, maybe let's take two questions right that's a that, that question fits, I think, well with mine, which is, uh, what do you think of if, if a governor of a state said, I love this process, I think we should implement it, and told his CIO, uh, okay, make this happen, like what, A, is kind of top-down kind of implementation of like this type of, pro have you, has the Gov Zero community thought about how to support such an implementation? Is there something um, kind of, uh, a antithetical about applying it from kind of an executive level on down without the community kind of self-organizing this and also and more concretely like how many app like you're using sandstorm you're using all of these softwares like what is kind of the minimum viable resource investment necessary to just put the infrastructure together to be able to implement this at any type of way that would be respected in kind of like the public arena yeah, um, so like how to bootstrap. Huh? Um, well, I, I think the minimum bootloader huh, uh, is, is very simply um, a, 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 a physical place because re really the, the architecture of the physical place of the digital public digital innovation space, um, I think determines the kind of people who want to go to it and who want to stay and who want to uh, basically make um, collective decisions and take risks uh, together. Uh, and I, I say this because this, this place was literally co-created by hundreds of social innovators. They asked for a kitchen and they got a kitchen, a chef, uh, it opens until 11 p.m. every night uh, and, and so on. So basically it, people feel that this place is where, where they, they are, where, where they kind of belong and where they w is willing to come back even after after spectacular failures in experimentation. And this whole notion of just going into space and see some self-driving tricycles roaming around <laughs> is, is seen as kind of a social norm. Every time you go into such an innovation lab, you will find new ideas and new experiments running around. And so for me, if there's one single thing, it's this uh, recurring reflective, recursive space uh, that allows for a culture of people just authentically sharing their experiments and failure streams and whatever, and, and then still willing to, to come back to the place. And this is also the place we hold all the, you know, um, my touring Taiwan and using video conferencing and so on. So the 12 different ministries people, when they go to this place, it feels like play, right? It, even if it's actually work, but, but it feels like play because they, they get to see new experiments, new social innovations along the way, and they understand that they are not under any sort of risk of attack, of protest or whatever. Uh, people cannot attack them over the monitor anyway, so everybody um, acts very civilized and so on. So it gradually it lowers the fears, uncertainty, and doubt of public service when it comes to public engagement. And, and that is really the only thing that's missing because the career public service is perfectly capable journalists and specialists to deal with this, this kind of issues. It was just the silos that prevents the, their empathy from you know, showing forward and things like that. So just creating this recursive space and culture, I think, is the bootloader that, that you, you just talked about and also what I would recommend when uh, you know bootstrapping from a new municipality and whatever, and we hold training uh, classes actually uh, in this June in NYC, and also very soon I think November in in Canada uh, and in many other places. So we're we're building an English curriculum of the curriculum that we're offering uh, to the municipalities in Taiwan. Yeah. So 
sorry, general personality or, or, or personality or, or technical skills as well, though, that really make um, uh, civil servants that are engaging on uh, on these projects successful, especially given the fact that you're introducing them to a, a very new novel uh, environment right. and approach so, to so doing their work. Yeah. I think I didn't get much uh, time to talk about uh, PDIS, uh, the public digital innovation space, which is kind of a reincarnation of the GovZero culture within the uh, central administration. Uh, PDIS is at the moment, I think, 20 two full-timers, about 40 or so interns. Uh, so it's like a small internal startup uh, within the central government. It's like policy lab or whatever and everywhere. But uh, what sets Peter's apart though is that uh, I'm, I talk as part of my compact uh, when I joined the cabinet that I can poach at most one person from each ministry to work full time in the public digital innovation space. So they're not like the POs. The POs, they grow, they, they uh, get new POs in the third level, fourth level agencies. The PO network just grows. It's now more than 60 people now. But PETAs remains small because it's at most one person from each ministry, which means the maximum capacity is 32 people because there's 32 ministries in Taiwan, you see. So because of that, it is by definition cross-functional. It is by definition people who care about various many different things. But what's not um, what was a constant here is that uh, everything joins by voluntary association, and I don't even give them command. Uh, I don't even rate them or score them. Everybody writes their own job description, writes their own scorecard. If they want to do something, they have to pitch to the rest of the team who all came from different ministries anyway. So you better find some common values. Uh, and, and so it means that first, all the uh, mechanism that came out of PITIS doesn't sacrifice any other ministry. It is not a place to do ministry or politics because every other people are there too. And we, we work out loud using the traditional traditional uh, open source free software uh, mechanism. And the second thing is that when we do the recruiting, we, we find that people who are willing to join naturally are more of a giver. They, they wish to contribute more than what they think they can take uh, to the public good. And this is not some HR you know, criteria. It's just you know in an anarchist workspace, you have to be this kind of people in order to have fun. Otherwise, it's just not fun at all. Uh, because if you are after, you know, you know, petty politics or whatever, you, you don't get much satisfaction from an anarchist minister. And so that's the second thing, is the fulfillment of, of giving uh, and contributing. And the third thing, I think, uh, really is just a PITIS being a kind of risk-free space for you to do the experiments. Because if anything goes wrong, it's always Audrey's fault. And so <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what gives the, empowers the career public service. So we have um, our PITIS member from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> and, and there's many other uh, ministries, people currently in Taiwan. Uh, any, do we have a, any final questions? Okay, you, if you've earned it, cameraman. Thank you. Um, so I have a small two-part question. The first is uh, sort of related to the, M the minimum, minimum viable resource question, which is, is technology crucial to decentralized consens consensus making, uh, you know, to what you do? And the second part is, if it's not, uh, if it is, then have there been attempts to game the system because anything that's online, you know, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp, there's always people who find a way to game the system. And have there been instances of people trying to game uh, V-Taiwan? And how did you overcome that? Yeah, so, um, so I think we, we usually say civic tech. But uh, I mostly think in a framework of calm technology in the sense that technologies that allows people to focus more on each other uh, rather than distract people's attention from each other and calm or assistive or ambient however you want to call it technology of course doesn't have to be digital uh, it could be post-it notes it could be you know whiteboard or whatever so uh, it could be you know sign language used during the occupy right it could be uh, people's microphones so <laughs> there's all sorts of uh, technologies that you can deploy without it being a digital technology and we use the digital technology mostly because it allows this experience to scale um, you know, uh, horizontally and to for the um, ideas and thoughts and reflections reached in a face-to-face -face setting to kind of ripple out uh, 
but without kind of dying down because there's just not too many people joining the protest on the street. So it is more in the conservation uh, part of it, of the consensus making process, than the amplification part of it. We're not too big on the amplification part of it. But even though, um, having said that, the joint platform is now 5 million users out of 23 million uh, population, which is not too bad. Um, so the gaming part, uh, back when we did Airbnb case, which is right after UberX, Airbnb sent an email to all its Taiwan members and asking them to come to Polis and support the Airbnb position. Uh, and what they found out was that instead had this be a simple yes-no question or a simple questionnaire, maybe people would have behaved as the email told them to do. But because this is an open-ended, reflective space, uh, only one-third of people they recruited this way actually agree with the Airbnb position. <laughs> Many other people have much more nuanced, much more uh, eclectic, much more resonating uh, feelings because they're, they're just motivated to, to press one like, but what it gets uh, from you know opening the link is actually a larger crowd, a larger system, uh, a more holistic approach, an overview effect, if you will, on the problem space. And in that reflective uh, space, people behave very differently than people mobilized just to press one like on things. And of course, we, we see people trying to use bots and things like that, but it's not really a big problem. If you write a bot that votes exactly the same for 5,000 different, uh, you know, entries, it's just one dot in the principal component map because we don't even look at the numbers. What we're looking at is the diversity, is whether you can propose something that resonates with more people. And if you can write a bot that generates a sentiment that resonates with more people, I for one welcome. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so far that has not happened. Uh, the hour is getting late, so uh, let me close us out in the following way. Um, this past Saturday was International Day of Democracy. Uh, International Day of Democracy is a UN-created holiday, for those of you who don't know, who really, which really tries to zero in and focus on one specific aspect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is, uh, celebrates its 70th anniversary this year. And that is namely the idea that democracy in that 70-year-old version is the conduct of periodic and genuine elections. Mm -hmm. So for those of us on this side of the table who think and feel that, democrat that the voting once a year is not enough and that we can do better, that we can do better in the way that you are trying to do in Taiwan and I think have shown us may be possible, I wanted to ask and point to all of you that on your chair you will find a manifesto on what Audrey referred to a number of times in passing, the idea of crowd law. So the idea of crowdsourcing plus lawmaking, the idea of all of us can play a bigger and better role in engaging in how our governments make law and policy. So if you like this idea of doing more things like VDIWAN and PDIS and the participation officers and the digital lab thing, which was dig digital social, social innovation lab, um, and this whole ecosystem of initiatives that really is a thicker, more active vision of democracy, I would just invite you please to sign the manifesto and leave it behind on your chair and we will collect it. You can also go online to manifesto.crowd.law. Audrey has signed it. Uh, and so I would just, and it's a really a call to all of us, to our city councils and parliaments and legislatures, to our technologists and to each of us to play more of a role in the way that you have shown us. Um, I want to just ask you as a final question then to give us the big vision. Uh, we started with uh, the worried fear about democracy. The future of democracy for you, are you s optimistic? Are you pessimistic? And how do we realize this big vision? Close us out and then we will drink wine and cheese and pepper you with more questions. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> back when I uh, took the post of digital minister, as I said, I had a compact, a covenant, not a contract, uh, but they still want a job description. Uh, and so instead of a job description, I just wrote the administration a poem uh, or a prayer, <laughs> which would serve as the job description as the digital minister. And I think that answers uh, the question. So, which is why I want to read the poem to you now. Um, and it goes like this. Uh, when we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. 
When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for coming. Jeff Mulgan, the only person I know who's just as smart as Audrey, uh, and who is also a Buddhist monk, by the way, in case you didn't know that, uh, and advised three prime ministers in the UK, is coming to talk about his book, Big Mind and Collective Intelligence and Democracy, 26 next Wednesday over lunch, a little bit shorter, but we, uh, I think we feed you uh, a little bit more. And with that said, uh, please come, mingle, talk, cheese cubes await. Thank you, and thank you, Audrey, so much.